Hello, fellow Whovians, and welcome to episode two of the Holy Whovian History Podcast. And today, we are looking at the William Hartnell years, and the backstory of him, his tenure as the Doctor. So without further ado, let's get into it. So, after actors Hugh David, who later became a director on the series, and Geoffrey Bailden had both turned down approaches to star in Doctor Who, Verity Lambert and the first serials director Warris Hussein managed to persuade 55-year-old character actor William Hartnell to take the part of the Doctor. Now, Hartnell was mostly known for playing army sergeants and other tough characters in a variety of films, but Lambert had been impressed with a sensitive performance in a rugby league talent scout in the film version of This Sporting Life, which inspired her to offer him the role. Now, Hartnell's doctor would initially be accompanied by his granddaughter Susan Foreman, played by actress Carol Ann Ford, originally to have been merely a travelling companion, but with a family tie added by Coburn, who was rather uncomfortable with the possible undertones the relationship could carry were they to be unrelated. Yeah, he didn't really think much of his audience, did they? Hmm. Anyway, they were joined in the first episode by two of Foreman's school teachers, Barbara Wright, played by actress Jacqueline Hill, and Ian Chesterton, William Russell, of course, the famous speaker of the London 1965 meme. From contemporary 20th century England, now this remained the lineup of the series for the entire first season, but over time the regular lineup would change regularly as the Doctor's various companions left him to return home, having found new causes on worlds they'd visited or had elected to stay there, or even occasionally being killed off. Hmm. However, he would always quickly find new travelling companions. Such characters were used by the production team to relate the point of view with the viewers at home, asking questions and furthering the stories by getting into scrapes. And the first pilot episode of the series, An Unearthly Child, had to be re-recorded owing to technical problems and errors made during the performance, uh, most notably the TARDIS doors opening and shutting randomly and dodgy camera work. It just wasn't great. It's the adventure in time and space for how that happened. And also, by the way, that initial pilot episode is featured on the DVD of An Unearthly Child. So, during the days uh, between the two tapings, changes were made to costuming, effects, performances, and script, which had originally featured a more harsh, callous doctor, and Susan doing rather unexplained things, such as flicking ink on paper and folding it to produce a symmetrical pattern, and then tracing shapes over the pattern. Now, the second version of An Earthly Child, the first episode of the very first serial, was transmitted at 5.15pm on the 23rd of November 1963, but due to both a power failure in certain areas of the country and the overshadowing news of the tragic assassination of US President John F. Kennedy, it drew minimal comment and was repeated the following week immediately before the second episode. This was a particular request by Verity Lambert to Sidney Newman. Um, originally, Newman didn't want to do this because it was rather unheard of to re sort of rescreen an episode, but we eventually got that. Um, it wasn't until the second serial, The Daleks, that the program caught the imagination of viewers and began to ingrain itself in the popular consciousness. Like, you know, you'd be sitting on the bus or walking down the street and you'd, you'd, you'd hear kids just screaming exterminate and just running around pretending to have a TARDIS just having fun you don't really see that nowadays do you hmm. now this was primarily due to the Dalek creatures introduced in this story devised by scriptwriter Terry Nation and his designer Raymond Kusick they were completely unhumanoid and like nothing that had ever been seen on television before now Originally, Sidney Newman did not like the idea of the Daleks because, famously, he did not want any robots or bug-eyed creatures in Doctor Who, but pretty much Doctor Who is made of those things now. Lambert had, in fact, been strongly advised against using Nation's, Nation's script by her direct superior, Donald Wilson, but used the excuse that they had nothing else ready to produce it. Now, once it was clear what a great success it had been, Wilson admitted to Lambert that he would no longer interfere with the decisions. She clearly knew the programme better than he did. Wise choice, Wilson. 
Now, Hartnell's doctor wasn't initially paternal or sympathetic. He described himself and Susan simply as wanderers in the fourth dimension. He was cantankerous, bossy, and occasionally showed a streak of ruthlessness. However, the character mellowed as he grew closer to his companions, and he soon became a popular icon, especially among children who watched the series. This alteration in the portrayal of the Doctor began during the fourth serial, the infamous Marco Polo. The Doctor's role was minimal during episode 2, The Singing Sands, and from a later episode, his portrayal of the character mellowed considerably. The program became a great success, frequently drawing audiences of 12 million or more. And the Daleks came back for several return appearances and are now the most iconic villain in Doctor Who. Whittaker left the show early in the second season, though he continued writing it until 1970, being briefly replaced by Dennis Spooner, who in turn was replaced by Donald Tosh at the end of the season. Pinfield also left halfway through the season due to poor health, but he was not replaced. And by the time of the third season in 1965, however, some difficulties were beginning to arise. Lambert had moved on to be replaced as producer by John Wiles, who didn't have a good working relationship with Hartnell. Now, the lead actor himself was finding it increasingly difficult to remember his lines because he was sadly suffering from the early stages of the arteriosclerosis that would later cause his death. Wiles and Tosh came up with a way of writing Hartnell out in the story The Celestial Toymaker, which we only actually have one episode of now, by having the Doctor made invisible for part of the story, intending that when he reappeared, he would be played by a new actor. However, Wiles was forbidden to replace Hartnell by the new head of serials, Gerald Savory. What good name. Wiles had also hoped to make other bold changes, such as introducing a companion with a Cockney accent, which was vetoed, as he was told all characters must speak BBC English. Yeah... I don't know if a Cockney companion would have worked. Uh, and resigned shortly afterwards, allegedly after learning that he would be sacked at the end of the season. <laughs> I mean, okay. With Tosh also resigning on principle. By 1966, however, it was clear that Hartnell's health was affecting his performances and he would not be able to carry on playing the Doctor for a long period of time. By this point, Savory had moved on as head of serials and his successor, Sean Sutton, was more agreeable to change, allowing Wilde's replacement in as Lloyd to make many of the very changes that Wilde had been barred from. Lloyd discussed the situation with Hartnell, and the actor agreed that it would be best to leave, although later in life he would claim that he had not wanted to go. So that concludes um, episode 2 of the Holy Hoovian History podcast, uh, documenting the William Hartnell years of the programme. Uh, like I said, this is just sort of a brief history of the production behind the programme. Uh, I will in future episodes be going through stories from the seasons, my favourite stories, my least favourite stories and stuff like that but this first part of the these first few episodes are going to be backstory, production, all of that so yeah, thank you very much for listening if you are indeed still listening and I hope t- that you will tune in for episode 3 of the Holy Hooving History Podcast which will talk about the Patrick Troughton years Thank you very much, I've been a rat nerd. Allons-y! <laughs>